was a lot of work. Just plain work. When work at home is planned and organized for cooperation, there can usually be more time for leisure. I'm certainly in favor of those things. Leisure, fun. Who is it? Wouldn't we all be happier if we worked out a little system for living together in harmony? And how can we manage them? We'll have to work out the full answer together. Say, Mom, it's well. discussion, which points the way to a happy family life. You know, this is beginning to be quite a family project. It certainly is. Hey, good morning, and uh, hey, thanks, uh, thank you, Jimmy, for leading. I, Jeremy and Livia don't get to get out of here very often, and when they do, we always have to, have, we need to find somebody to help lead, and so I think Jimmy did a great job this morning, so appreciate it. A little, little bit of a throwback Sunday, but that's okay every now and then. We, I, I grew up on some of those songs, so it's cool. I appreciate him stepping up to lead on that. We're in the middle of this series called, uh, we're in the second week of the series called My Imperfect Family. And uh, anybody's uh, family imperfect? Uh, mine, I think all of our fam- families are imperfect. But uh, this time of year, I, I, I wanted to comment on all of them, but like there were so many back to school pictures on Facebook, I couldn't keep up. This week, it was like, y'all look great, by the way. You looked phenomenal, uh, kids. You guys are doing great. I'm so excited that you get to start back. But um, it's just this time of year where, I don't know if you feel that way. I know families do, young families in our church. It's the time of the year that you, you get in the grind, right? Like you're back in the grind. School starts, you're back. You, you got all the school clothes, you know, sports schedules. You've got, you know, you're back in the grind students. The students that are here, you got term papers to write and test to study for or cheat on, however you roll. Um, cheating was hard. You remember, like, back in our day, like, cheating, like, it's easy. Like, chat GPT changed the game now. Like, you just, AI, just write my paper for me. I, none of you do that, I'm sure. Uh, but back in my day, I, I sound old when you say that, right? Like, back in my day, we had to write, you had to write the entire Constitution on, like, a gum wrapper, you know? Uh, and, and, and try to pull it off that way. But however you roll, uh, it's just that time we recognize families and we get engaged to group and we get, uh, we get engaged with each other again and, and we're spending a lot of time with our families. But um, some are like the routines never stop and I understand that. But uh, regardless of whether you're actively raising kids or if you've got grandkids or uh, if you've just been part of family, uh, you know, we have families, uh, and you're part of a family, you're part of this church family. And so we're talking through some of the things and really just focused on uh, the Beatitudes. Uh, and the Beatitudes, we'll talk a little bit more about what those are if you're new to church or if it's your first time at church, uh, kind of what those are and, and, what the, and what God had in mind for us with those. But last week, we talked about hunger and thirsting. We really talked about that we are, we're not a Christian family, we are a Christ-centered home, and what that means to actually hunger and thirst after righteousness, because uh, that, that was the beatitude that Jesus spoke, you know. Uh, when you hunger and thirst after this relationship with Jesus, it changes things. It changes things in your family. It changes things for you personally. And so we talked a little bit about that uh, last week. Um, um, let me, I want you to think really quick, have, and, and my, some of you may not think very hard because it was on your way to church this morning, but um, uh, when's the last time you had conflict in your family? Like, some of you are like, I was just slapping my kids this morning. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to church, you're whipping in here, like, you know. Uh, but when is the last time, you know, I, and you think about, I want you to think for a minute about the conflict in your family. And for some of you, that's painful, right? I, I, I know that's not a, I know we laugh, but it's not a, it's not a funny thing. Uh, it's a serious thing. But uh, some of us, we just have, we're, we're families, we just have conflict. And your family is not perfect, and that's okay. You're going to have conflict. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. I remember when Cheryl and I were first married, even before we had kids, we had conflict. Anybody have conflict when you were first married, married couples? Anybody? I'll never forget. Like she, we lived in these little uh, Sherwood apartments right over here because uh, they were income-based, and we also were poor. Um, uh, and so we lived over here, income-based apartments, and we got this little apartment. It was so fun, and we had this upstairs apartment, and uh, we would, we lived up there, and and we we would have conflict. She would get mad. I remember one time she got mad and just like stormed out. I was like, "Where are you going?" She was like, "I don't know." 
Like, you know, and we would fight. And go, but I remember it, like we'd have, I, we would walk up those steps to our apartment, and I'm just going to put that. If you're a husband and your wife is in front of you on the stairs, what, what do you There's a goose involved. There just has to be. 100%. You don't look at me, Nick Walsh. I know you. Like, I see you back there, but there's a goose involved. I remember I goose Cheryl so hard. So even to this day, Cheryl walks upstairs like this. Like, but there was just this conflict. There was always, and she was so mad when I did that, but it was so funny. But now it is. <clears throat> I survived. But there's this, regardless of what that is, whatever that looks like, what's that conflict look like in your family? Is it physical? Is it yelling? Is it name-calling phrases? You know, it, there, it involves phrases. Like a lot of times you'll hear a phrase like, well, you always do this, or you never do this, or you always, and we have this conflict. So just really quickly, and, and I know this is a sensitive subject, and I don't want to make light of it, but how peaceful is your home on a scale of 1 to 10? What would you rate it? Don't say that out loud. <laughs> I should have had counselors ready after. How well do you handle conflict in your family? And, and, and is that handled in a, in a way that is a Christ-centered home? Uh, is it handled in a manner? And, and I got to tell you that sometimes it's not always. We want it to be but it's probably not always handled in exactly the way it should be handled. So many of our homes are characterized by conflict versus peace. Uh, there's just a lot of conflict. Um, some of you this morning are going, hey, that's me, and you have no idea what's going on in my home. Some of you are like, my home or family, is. there's a lot of dysfunction in my family. Um, and I know we have that, some of that. You're dreading the holidays. They're coming up. They'll be here before you know it, and, and, and you dread it because you have to be around your family. Uh, there's tension. There's strife. The weddings are always interesting when I do weddings, uh, especially when I meet with, those, with those, the married couples beforehand. We do marriage counseling, and, and we're going through the wedding ceremony, and we have to be really strategic about who walks with who because, you know, Bob can't walk with Lucy, and Lucy is ticked off at Jerry, and there's this... You know, there's this all kinds of family dynamic that gets weird at weddings. And uh, so every home, I know without a doubt, everybody, every, and this is true too, like every, every, every family, you ever notice this? Um, every family has like a psycho. Like there's one, there's one family member that's just, if you're clapping, it's probably you. So... If for some reason there's there we but <laughs> if you think I don't have there's no psycho what do you, it's probably you so um, just so you know but every family has one like we have these weird family dynamics and it's just crazy and every family member has a psycho but for some reason in our homes we tend to hurt each other uh, and, and maybe on purpose, and maybe by accident, or maybe it's we just don't see eye to eye, or we just live together, and there's going to be conflict. And so um, I'll never forget when my dad uh, was aging, and my dad, uh, toward the end of his life, wrestled with dementia. And so you know my dad, and I was the pastor of this church for a long time. But when my dad wrestled with the dementia, we spent a lot of time, and Rachel and uh, I'll never forget Rachel was helping him one day, and we would have lead him around, and uh, he grabbed her arm, and it was a little tight, and uh, she's like, oh, Papa, you hurt me, and he's like, well, you hurt my heart, so, and, and um, I think that's where we land sometimes in our families. We hurt each other's heart, sometimes on purpose. Sometimes by accident, and sometimes it's just through temptation, and we, we fall short, and we're imperfect people, and we do things that hurt each other, and we don't mean to sometimes, and sometimes we do, and it's just, it's just part of it. So what do we do with it? Like, how do, how do we navigate this conflict in our life? And, um, you know, there was this thing when I was a kid growing up too. I, I had a wonderful home growing up. My my parents loved us unconditionally and um, provided for us the best they could. But we still had conflict. I, I mean, 
uh, I was raised in a Christian home. It was a Christ-centered home, but we still had conflict. And uh, you know, I want to talk to the kids here. Do you have any kids here this morning, like, what is the worst thing that your parents can say to you? It's probably not, no, give me your phone, but that may be it. Um, but there's, there was a phrase that, that you know, and, and some of you have parents, you know this, like there's nothing worse than this phrase. And I'll just kind of give you a backstory. When I was, I, I grew up in a very legalistic church environment. We, we grew up when the church was kind of a legalistic uh, type of church culture where you, there were a lot of rules about things that you could and couldn't do. And one of those things that we could not do growing up in the church of Nazarene, and some of you are going to think this is crazy, but this is how churches do sometimes. And sometimes get, people get hurt by the church and they leave and they quit. And that's why people don't come back to church. And I've talked about that a lot. But uh, you have church trauma. I think it's a real thing. Um, it's, it's, it's a true story. So when I grew up in this very legalist, one of the things that we were not allowed to do is go to the fair. Uh, we couldn't, and you're like, why would you not ever go to the fair? That's stupid. Well, uh, because, and, and this was the reasoning when I grew up, because there were games of chance at the fair, in other words, gambling. So apparently, uh, there was, uh, you know, we couldn't be exposed to things like throwing a quarter in a goldfish bowl and winning a goldfish, like that was gambling. So we just steered away from that. I think it was meant well, you know, try to keep us away from, you know, becoming addicted gamblers growing up. I don't know, by not going to the fair. It was just, it was, I'm not bitter. I need trauma. Does anybody have a good counselor's number? Um, but that's, it was just one of those things. And so when I grew up and got in high school, one of the things that was cool about my parents was they would, they, they really kind of, once we got to an age of high school, they realized that we had to start making some of our own decisions. So my friends asked me to go to the fair one. Me and my brother go to the fair growing up, and we knew the rules. Farron and I knew the rules. Like, we weren't allowed to go to the fair. And so we were in high school, and we were like, well, let's ask my parents. And so I asked mom, like, and she was like, my mom said this. Was She was like, go ahead, and, and you, guys, you guys make your own decision, and you know how we feel. And so we were like, cool, see ya, you know. <laughs> Went to the fair. <laughs> And so it, it hurt my mom's heart, and we were like, are you mad? She's like, no, I'm just what? There you go. That's the worst thing your parents can say. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. And so I think sometimes the relationships are difficult. There's always some, you know, when you think about raising, there's always some parent trying to tell you how to raise your kids, or some, your kids are always fighting, or there's teenagers, and parent, your teenagers are like, my parents are so controlling, they never let me do anything, and there's marriages, and you're, you've got a blended family, and you're dealing with exes, and trying to figure out how to make their kids and our kids, and how it all fits, and like husbands and wives that don't get along, and they don't know how to communicate, and there's in-laws that, that you'd like to treat like outlaws, and it's just tricky. And so how do we wrestle with that as, as Christian people or followers of Jesus Christ? And so here's what I want to, I want to focus on these Beatitudes, and if you, uh, they're found in Matthew chapter 5, they're at the beginning of a sermon, um, that Jesus, that is titled the Sermon on the Mount. And really, Jesus gave us these lists of things that he <clears throat> really, really guidelines for life is what they were. They're a lifestyle. If you, if you would read through these, and I encourage you to go through them. I'd love to be able to go through them all in this series, but we're not going to have time. Um, but they are a lifestyle. They are a perfect plan of the way our lives should look. And they affirm God's perspectives, his priorities, and his boundaries for each one of us, okay? Now, when you read through them, you're like, man, all those things are awesome, but I don't know that I can actually pull all that off. And you're right, you can't. Because we have imperfect families and we're imperfect people. We need, God, we need the Holy Spirit's help to be able to live like Jesus outlines in these Beatitudes. And, and, and that includes how we address and deal with conflict in and outside of our families. So this week, I want to look at this. Um, God, last week it was God blesses those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. This week, I want to address what it means to be a peacemaker. Because the beatitude that I want to focus on today is Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. I'm going to read it in two different versions. Uh, the first is the NIV version. If you have an NIV Bible, it reads like this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I have an NLT Bible. It's a New Living Translation, if you're wondering, because <laughs> it kind of dumbs it down for me, which is what I need. Uh, it says, God blesses those who work for peace, 
for they will be called children of God. Now, you read that and go, okay, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? And, and a peacemaker is someone who reconciles people who are formerly in conflict with one another. Okay? A peacemaker is somebody that sees people in conflict and goes to them and goes, hey, let me, is there a way that we can fix this? I want, I want, to, try to, I want to try to rectify this, this issue that you have in your life. And he came, so the heart of Jesus' mission was to bring peace to God and those who would accept him through faith. That was the heart of his mission. He came so that we might have peace with God, a.k.a. church word righteousness, which just basically means that we're in a good relationship with God. And Jesus died on the cross so that we could have peace with God. He was, in fact, the ultimate peacemaker. But he did so with, with he, he did that by laying down his own life or at the cost of his own life, not at the cost of others' lives, okay? So he was the perfect example of what a peacemaker looked like. And, and so Paul talks about that. And I want to kind of give you, bear with me, because this is the history part, and it gets a little bit kind of boring, but, uh, but it's really important for the context of, of what I'm talking about here. Uh, there, was, there was conflict. There's a, there, I mean, you can't read the Bible without reading about conflict. There was tons of it in Scripture. Somebody was always in conflict. They were constantly fighting. They were constantly killing each other. They were constantly doing things. Jews and Gentiles were in conflict. And if you don't know what a, a Gentile, it's basically if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And so we're mostly Gentiles in here. But Jews and Gentiles in the first century were in conflict. And Jesus came to kind of marry that. Here's the thing. Most people thought that Jesus came because he was this Jewish king. He was Jewish. He was raised. He was going to free Israel. And that he was just, he was, that the gospel was just a Jewish thing. The fact of the matter is the gospel is a whole world thing. And the gospel is a uniter. The gospel in itself is a peacemaker. And so here, Paul kind of outlines this to a church in Ephesus. Uh, it's in your book of Ephesians. But Paul wrote a letter to this church, and here's what he said. Pay attention to this. It's, you kind of got to stick with it to, to catch it, but I'm going to read it for you. It'll be on the screen. For Christ himself was, was, has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility and separated us. So that's, that's, a, that's a meaty verse, <laughs> okay? When you read that verse, here's what Jesus broke down this wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles by dying on the cross. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 15, he did this by ending the system of law with his commandments and regulations. Now, to understand that, you have to understand that the Jews, they were still very much adhering to the law of Moses, which was, which was the Ten Commandments that, that God gave Moses. They, the Jews had taken that Ten Commandments and turned it into 613 different rules. And if you didn't follow those rules, you couldn't be saved, okay? Jesus basically said he didn't come to abolish that. He came to fulfill it, but it's no longer about following a bunch of rules. It's more about a relationship with him, okay? That's what Paul is saying here. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He, dis he did that by ending this system of law with its commandments and regulations. And this very next verse, the next three words, he made peace. He was, in fact, a peacemaker. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. In other words, we're all part of this family. Together as one body, the body of Christ, which if you're a follower of Jesus, you belong to this body. Christ has reconciled both groups by God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Okay? He brought this good news and peace to you and Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. So ultimately, he was this ultimate peacemaker. That's what it's supposed to look like. You put yourself, you sacrifice yourself in order to make peace between two groups that are, that are not getting along. That's what Jesus did. He was the ultimate example. Unfortunately, 
When we hear the word peacemaker, some of us, especially gun enthusiasts in the room, think of this. If you don't know what this is, does anybody know what that is? Some of you do, because you're a gun enthusiast. This is, and, and, and before you all freak out, I'm not, I'm not going to do some kind of political point here. <laughs> this isn't some gun. I'm a gun owner. Anyone, <clears throat> anybody know what this specific gun is called? It's a a Colt peacemaker. Colt, when they first created this revolver in 1873, named it a peacemaker. It's pretty interesting. I was reading about that. They found the first one ever made in the barn in New Hampshire. I'm just jealous. Thought I'd throw that in. Anyway, but this is sadly, it's sad that our culture, it's just interesting to me that they named this the peacemaker. And I think this is just a reflection of our culture. Because this, this is how we think we make peace. It's through violence. Or through a weapon. Our culture is eye for eye. Tooth for tooth. We all would be well served if we were to read the entire chapter 5 of Matthew. Later in chapter 5 of Matthew... Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount addresses the issue of our culture. He he talks about anger and adultery and divorce and revenge. You should go read chapter 5 of Matthew today, this afternoon, when you get home. Later in the verse, Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Somebody slaps you on the face. You turn the other cheek and let them slap the other side. If you're sued for your shirt, Jesus said, give them your coat too. If you're forced to walk a mile, walk two. That's what peacemaking looks like. People in our culture, and here's here's the issue. We think we have the right to be angry. You, somebody, somebody along the line, somebody has done, and you may. I mean, it's, it's a human emotion. God understands it. We think they have the right to seek revenge. We think the right to be offended or to be hurt. And we think of ourselves first. But when we put ourselves first, you put peace last. Peacemakers. Now, there's a difference. It's like there are peacemakers and then there are peacekeepers. You think, okay, what's the difference? I'm going to tell you. Thanks for asking. Uh, Does anybody here just absolutely love conflict? Like, you just, man, I can't wait for some conflict. Anybody? Some of y'all are lying. (laughs) And some of you do, and here's how I know I can tell. I see your social media posts. You just can't scroll by, can you? You feel the overwhelming need to be a pot stirrer instead of a peacemaker. And this election's going to get closer and the pot's going to get stirred more and more. Jesus did not say, blessed, well, he might, blessed are the pot stirrers, for they will be annoying to everyone. The reality is we're all going to face some sort of conflict in this lifetime, whether it's at school this year, students, you're going to run into that person or that. A lot of times in high school, it's girls, I've noticed, that seem to have some issues with each other. Um, Guys, we just duke it out at the bike rack and then we're good. At work, on social media, and here's the the one that always gets me crazy, is we, we have it here. Isn't that weird? Of all places, the church. You have conflict in the church. Even in the church of all places, conflict is itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It's how we manage that conflict. Now, here's the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Uh, Peacekeepers, peace, peacekeepers, 
will often just avoid conflict to keep the peace. And some of you are peacekeepers, but you're not peacemakers. You're peacekeepers. And here's what a peacekeeper does. They just get along no matter what. Hey, whatever, I, I'm just going to go with the flow. I don't, I, whatever I want to do, I just don't want to make waves. Yeah, he talks to me like garbage, but I'm not going to say anything. Wives. Why do you let him get away with that? Well, I just don't want to make waves. I just want to avoid this conflict at all costs. It's like the giant 800-pound gorilla in the room everywhere you go. Nobody bring it up. Nobody talk about it. We're just going to keep peace. We're just going to be, keep, we're just going to be peacekeepers and pretend like everything's okay and come into church and go, hey, how are you? We're so good. And you're not. It's called avoidance. <laughs> Let's just see if we can have a truce. Let's walk on some eggshells, everybody, and keep peace because we know if you say something, it's going to tick him off or tick her off. He didn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. The difference is a peacemaker will embrace conflict for the ultimate goal of making peace. A peacemaker goes, this is going to be ugly, but we need to walk through this. We may need to get some help to walk us through it. We may have to agree to disagree. But the fact of the matter is marriages are going to die. And I, marriages and relationships are going to end because some husbands are too proud to see a counselor. And that's the God's honest truth. I've talked to a lot of... The last thing a guy wants to hear is, we need to talk. Oh, gosh. I don't want to. I don't want to do it. You're too proud to see a counselor. Parents that don't even want to try to understand their teenagers. A lot of people are like, least kids today, that's baloney. I want you to think back when you were a kid. You did some of the same stuff. Adults have changed. I bet a dollar to a donut that you were doing some of the same thing to your parents that your kids are doing to you. Peacemakers. Jesus. The Prince of Peace. We are not just a Christian home. We are a Christ-centered home. A Christ-centered home isn't conflict-free. Trust me, I grew up in one. It was a Christ-centered home. But we still had conflict. Someone does something to you and you're like, well, they have to come back crawling back on their hands and knees. Blessed are the peacemakers. It's saying sorry when you don't feel like you need to say sorry. And many of you are sitting here thinking this message applies to someone else. And you're sitting here going, man, I hope so-and-so is listening. Romans 12, 7 and 18 say this. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful what you be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So that's the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. What do peacemakers do? Here's what peacemakers do when they address conflict. Ephesians chapter 4, 15 says this. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. We have got to address the conflict, and you have to be able to learn to speak the truth in love to people. I mean, speaking the truth to your kids and go, you always leave your blankety-blank stuff laying around. That may be true, but that is not spoken in love. Non-conflict times. Confront the issues in non-conflict times. Confront issues in non-conflict. Um, Cheryl and I, I remember we've learned in our marriage over 31 years. Is it 31? She doesn't know either. 
31, 32. <laughs> we've learned, and I, I, there were specific times that we've learned, like, okay, we, we've sat down and we've addressed things. They're like, okay, well, when you say this, this is what I hear. She's like, she, Cheryl will say, oh, man, the weather's really nice this week in Florida. And I hear, you got to make that happen. You got to learn to communicate, but you have to be able to speak the truth in love. When you don't listen to me, I don't feel like you value me. When you raise your voice, I don't feel safe. You may not even notice, but with our friends, you take little jabs and jokes at me, and it hurts. When you continue to check your phone at the table, I feel devalued. When you lie, it's insignificant. It's just really hard to trust you. You, if we're going to address and be peacemakers, you have to find a way to speak the truth and love to each other. It's okay to tell the truth. You just got to do it in a way that is in a loving manner. And it's okay to get some help. It's okay to have a third party and a referee for that. In fact, I think I would highly encourage it. The second thing peacekeepers do is they apologize when you're wrong. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And I am convinced that the hardest two words in the English language for people to say is, I'm sorry. Be the bigger person. Take the high road. And, I, and, I, and I, when you say you're sorry, I mean, actually mean it. We don't need like a backhanded, well, I'm sorry you got your feelings hurt, you big baby. That's not an apology. Say you're sorry. Admit specific actions and attitudes with no excuses. I shouldn't have raised my voice. I should have called you and let you know where I was going to be, mom and dad. I should have... I should have not dropped the cat off the roof. Admit it. Say you're sorry. I shouldn't have been a Cubs fan. Like just, just come out with it. Remorse and repentance. I'm sorry is for mistakes. Will you forgive me of this sin that I've done against you? And I, I'm telling you, forgiveness is hard. I'm not saying it's easy. And I, I said at the beginning of this message that you, when you read through these Beatitudes and you think, man, that's really awesome. I wish I could live like that. You can't do it on your own. You need the Holy Spirit's help. There are some things that need forgiven that you don't have the power to forgive until the Holy Spirit gives you that power to forgive and confront that and address it. There are grown adults in this room probably that are still walking around carrying stuff about your parents that you're mad at or what somebody did to you. Which brings me to my third point. Forgive and let it go. Now, you have to have, and I know that's hard because there's significant, there are some significant betrayals that have taken place in our families and in your relationships abuse and adultery and you've suffered greatly at the hand of somebody else. And I don't want to stand here and pretend like that's going to be easy for you to forgive. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. That's the goal. And like I said, you can't get there by yourself. It's just not going to happen. But I tell you, when it happens, and when you lead people into that, and some of you need to be peacemakers with your family members. Some of you need to sit them down. Maybe you're the referee. Be a, peace, be a peacemaker. You forgave me, I forgive you. We have peace. I've done some bad things. Have you ever needed, for, have you, has anybody ever forgiven you of something? It's the greatest feeling in the world to know that you've been an idiot 
and you've done something that you deserve to be punished for and you deserve the worst, but somebody looks you in the face and says, hey, I forgive you, that's huge. Be that person. I think, somebody, I think so many times people think forgiveness is for, for the other people or the offender. They think, oh, well, if I'm not. People say it all the time. Some of you in this room have probably said, I don't care what happens. I'm never going to forgive them of that. That is dangerous, dangerous territory. In other words, what you've done is you've locked yourself in a prison. And you said, I have made a choice to carry this around my entire life with me. I'm never going to let go of it. I've got this 800-pound weight on my shoulders, and I'm going to choose to carry it with me until I die. That's dumb. Forgiveness is for you. It's not for the other person. Let yourself go. Pray that the Holy Spirit will help you with that. Family is worth it. As far as it depends on you and what you're willing to do for your family. Um, I have a really, really, really like really, really, really super cute grandson. If you haven't seen him, um, I've got just a slideshow really quick. No, just kidding. Um, I've got this really cute grandson, and um, and he loves his poppy. Um, if he was here, we would, I, I got to tell you this story really quick. We were at the house. He came over at the house the other day. And Cheryl and I were both standing each other, beside each other, and like, hey, come, you know. And he was running directly for me, but Cheryl intercepted him. <laughs> and she knows it's true. But one thing about him, and I, um, as he grows up, he looks exactly like his father. He is like mini Richard. And... I'm telling you, blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be the children of God. We will begin to look exactly like our Father if we spend time with Him. You will be a spitty image of your heavenly father if you allow him to change you from the inside out if you allow the Holy Spirit to help you release some of that hurt if you allow the Holy Spirit to help work through that conflict in your home if you humble yourself as a dad and as a husband and say hey we need to get some help blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. And I just want to encourage you families, listen, if you've got conflict in your home, it's okay. We all got it. You're not messed up. This is a hospital for the sick on Sunday mornings. This church, Jesus said, this is a hospital for the sick. So we all don't have to, we all know we're all sick. Okay. Let's just level playing field. So when you come in here, you don't have to pretend like everything is sunshine, rainbows, and roses at your house. Let's pray for one another. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. Let's get engaged in a life group this week with, with peers of, of, like that, that you're walking through life with. Get involved with some other people that you're walking through the same, the same stage of life with, whether you're a grandparent or whether you're a, a, young, a, a young married family with young kids and you're trying to figure out how not to screw up your kids and how to raise them right. If you're, get together, let's it, form your, if you have an idea for a group, form, get, talk to Jim. Say, hey, I got this idea. Um, some of you have done that. It's been wildly successful. Let's begin to learn how to make how to be peacemakers and how to fix our homes and how to, how to love each other and not hurt each other's heart. Let's offer forgiveness. Let's speak the truth in love. Let's seek help and seek the Holy Spirit itself. I'm going to let Cheryl come up and have her two cents. No, she's going to come up and just wrap a few things up. Um, she's probably going to tell something about me. Um, it's a free game, honey, but uh, thank you. Thanks for being here this morning. No, I... Um, as we get ready to close out this week, uh, as I was sitting down there, I, I mean, when we talk about being authentic, 
uh, the truth is there's each and every one of us, um, we are part of families, part of relationships that have conflict. It's just, it's just the fact of, of life. And so I just hope that as I was sitting there, I just can't, couldn't help but um, feel heavy. I don't know if anyone else feels like the heaviness or the weight. Um, but what I hope more than anything is that you are encouraged to know that even though conflict is unavoidable, it also, we have a, a roadmap, a roadmap on how to deal with it in a Christ-like way. And so I just encourage you this week, if it's going out and having tough conversations this week or whatever that may look like, finding help, finding somebody to help you walk through that, um, do it because it's so worth it. Um, let's not give up on our families. The, the, just real quickly before we get out of here this week, um, if you are a student trying to register for the Refresh Conference and you've had a hard time getting the conference link, um, we've experienced a few people having a hard time getting that conference link to work, please get a hold of me or send me a message and I will make sure that we get that worked out for you. Um, but if you would, before we leave today, would you stand? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you this morning so thankful that you are a God who um, is the ultimate example of a peacemaker. Lord, I pray that for each and every person standing in this room today, you know our exact situations. You know our relationships, dear God. You know what our families are, are dealing with. And Lord, I know from experience, from the realness of, um, I know so many people may, may not be experiencing the whole back to school um, stress, but there are a lot of folks and a lot of families sitting in this place today that are, and Lord, we know that even just the simple the simple thing of going back to school that seems like it shouldn't be that big of a deal brings so many different stressors to families and students and um, relationships, dear God. I just pray that as we begin to this fall schedule, these fall routines, Lord, that you would uh, just help us to be people who are patient with one another, who are um, who are compassionate with one another. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place in each and every spot that we each stand, Lord, in our relationships, that you would help us to, um, to seek you first. And Lord, that we would um, just love each other the way that you love us, whatever that looks like. And God, I just pray that as we leave this place, that you would go before our Go before each, each one of us. You know what each one of us will face this week, Lord. And I pray that you would equip us to face it um, and, do, and, and that you would walk with us. And I ask these things in your awesome name. Amen. You guys, we hope that you have an awesome week. Thank you for being here. And if you have any questions or if you're new this morning, I'd love to meet you at the uh, welcome table. Have a great week.